Okay, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2023 workshop in uh, money, finance, and public policy. Uh, the event is hosted by the Economic Democracy Initiative at the Open Society University Network and by the Lieb Economics Institute here at Bard College. My name is Pavlina Chernova. I'm a professor of economics at Bard and the director of the, the Economic Democracy Initiative. Uh, this event uh, brings scholars in a conversation about the shifting um, winds in economic theory and economic thinking that took place after 2008 and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, after the 2008 financial crisis, uh, economic traditions from the margins of the profession that emphasize the political economy of money gained uh, increasing attention. Uh, in mainstream media, in part because they were able to predict the crisis, in part because uh, they were able to explain it, and also um, understand the implications of the unfolding policy responses. Now, COVID-19 pandemic uh, presents another such opportunity to uh, investigate the role of public policy and public finance in particular. And I emphasize public finance because the big monetary responses during 2008 and the big fiscal responses uh, in COVID, during COVID-19, um, illustrated a very basic real world stylized fact. And that is that money is not scarce. It did illustrate um, monetary and fiscal operations, technical aspects of public finance, the continued financial fragility despite the Fed put, and a range of de-risking strategies that can only be undertaken by public financing institutions. So these episodes also raise new questions about the nature of stabilization policy, this time increasing uh, interest rates, the emerging industrial strategies, policies for economic security, uh, and the green transition. And the tradition that we have been developing here at the Lead Economics Institute, along with colleagues at other institutions, um, is the modern money approach, which profoundly shaped uh, conversations across the globe over the last uh, few years. I think one of the most productive developments um, in heterodox economics is this new ecosystem um, of research programs and networks, including MNT that examine the public nature of money. I think this is a significant uh, development. Now in economics, money as a public institution was largely under theorized before the arrival of MMT. Heterodoxy had rightfully criticized mainstream theory for the absence of money and finance in their models. Um, heterodoxy itself uh, had focused on the endogeneity of money, on the importance of finance for investment and employment determination, the layering of debts over debts, the increasing financialization of the economy, um, all critically important topics. But I think it is fair to say that money as a public institution was largely absent from the heterodox research agenda. And I think that that has changed uh, today. We have substantive conversations today about uh, the monetary sovereignty, the spectrum of monetary sovereignty, the, how laws and institution, uh, institutions enable or thwart public spending and finance, uh, about the hierarchy of money, the hierarchy of currencies, the real versus financing limits governments face as they contemplate various policies. I think that these have been enabled by another productive development post 2008, um, and that is the synergies that economics developed in collaboration with scholars from other disciplines. So if money is a public institution, I think that the next task for us is to investigate more carefully the limits, uh, real uh, and imagined, as well as the capacities of the state to proceed with uh, policies for a more democratic and just economic order. Uh, this, in my view, is a research uh, agenda that's urgent and ripe for development. Now, what we have observed over the last few decades, certainly in the global north, is the rise of the whatever it takes financing paradigm. 
What have I takes, of course, is how Mario Draghi described ECB policies after 2008. Um, as I have argued in my own research, whatever it takes is really at the heart of the Bernanke doctrine. And um, I think that that unwittingly has paved the way for the whatever it takes fiscal policy responses that we observed in during the COVID pandemic. Um, and whatever it takes is, of course, what governments did to produce uh, vaccines on short order, and more importantly, to guarantee payroll, to guarantee uh, economic security for households and for firms. Again, this is in the global north. Uh, we know the numbers. Uh, Japan in one single year spent more than 50% of their GDP in fiscal responses, uh, numbers that were unheard of in the post-war era. In the United States, that uh, was 26% of GDP in one year. Um, Europe broke its own rules. Europe uh, uh, was able to finance uh, spending on the order of 10% or more, both in the core or in the periphery. Whether these countries were monetarily sovereign or not, uh, public finance turns out is abundant and available for core, core policy priorities. And where there are legal and institutional straitjackets, countries were able to shed them in order to proceed with crisis responses. So I think that uh, one of the lessons that we can draw from this is that we have public financing institutions, central banks, ministries of finance, treasuries will stand by uh, to fund these priorities. And um, this is tragically uh, nowhere more obvious than in the whatever it takes financing paradigm of forever wars. Just yesterday, the new speaker of the house had proposed a budget to fund Israel only if there were equivalent cuts elsewhere in the budget um, for the IRS. And what was the democratic response? If we did that, this will set a dangerous precedent where we have to find pay fors for policies for national security or other emergencies. Dangerous precedents. Of course, the irony is that the pay fors are the order of the day. Uh, when you think about any other policy priority and the whatever it takes paradigm is not the paradigm for the green transition. The whatever it takes financing paradigm is not what guides our thinking about economic security, um, which invariably reproduces the new liberal social economic order. Whatever it takes is not the paradigm that guides development in the global south. Uh, to the contrary, um, austerity is alive and well. Structural adjustments are the order of the day. Um, Dollar-denominated debt continues to define the limits of what is possible in Latin America, in Asia, parts of Asia, and Africa. Um, and yet, some of the financing tools of the Global North are also available in the Global South to a degree that is underappreciated. So currency hierarchies notwithstanding, spectrum of monetary policy notwithstanding, these are critical for understanding the possibilities. But nevertheless, even so, there is a degree of fiscal capacity that remains underutilized uh, even in the global south. And uh, this is why this workshop begin begins there. Uh, it begins in the global south. Uh, in order to examine some of these enduring obstacles and some of the unexplored possibilities. Uh, what I wanna leave you with is this, that despite the various proclamations that the neoliberal order, economic order had died during COVID, I think it's the whatever it takes paradigm that resuscitates it and perhaps even consolidates it. The paradigm is that the one that revives mismanaged or insolvent banks. It is the paradigm that underwrites the profits of industries that depend on predatory pricing and labor practices. We can go on and on. And yet it is the whatever it takes paradigm that illustrated the very methods and tools available for funding democratic priorities. It has shown us how we can de-risk not only capital markets, but labor markets as well. Um, it has shown us how we can eradicate poverty or provide health care and relative economic security to all. It has shown us how to finance uh, 
new technology, um, but uh, that finance is available for the green transition as well. So if money is a public institution, then we also want to examine the um, interdependence between public and private finance in order to consider ways of emancipating the former from the latter, both legally, institutionally, uh, at the policy level. So this conference hopes to push the boundaries of our current understanding of money and finance further uh, in order to reconsider policies for intersecting crises. We are going to talk about the spectrum of monetary sovereignty limits to policymaking in the global south, but we're also going to think uh, about how we can measure monetary sovereignty. Um, we'll talk about the flawed methodologies of sovereign debt ratings. Uh, we'll discuss global inequalities, the shifting meanings of neoliberalism, and the selective application of de-risking strategies. Uh, of course, we have to talk about the, Fred, the Federal Reserve's use and abuse of the Nairo, its resilience, um, as well as we want to ask the question, does Bidenomics represent a new paradigm in fiscal policy? Um, and if we are looking at the emergence of new industrial strategies, uh, I, I think a very interesting question is, are there, um, how can we investigate procurement strategies? Um, we're also going to talk about fintech and the promise and threats to democratic governance. So as we move through the discussion over the next uh, few days, uh, I invite you not only to share your thoughts, but also to raise the next wave of research questions, unexplored questions, the ones that we need as a community to start answering. Um, so, uh, before we open the first uh, for the first panel, I'd like to thank my team at EDI for their effortless organization, expert planning. Uh, in particular, I want to thank uh, program coordinator Tess Malova right there in the back, as well as research assistant Tyler Emerson and to uh, BARD uh, student researchers, Emmy Cooper and Shane Array. Many, many thanks to the Lead Economics Institute for co-hosting this event. And uh, without further ado, welcome. And I hope you have a productive and enjoyable workshop.